Holy City Center Radio. It is episode 39. We're almost at the big 40. Just like myself. My birthday was this past weekend, and I turned that terrible age of 39. It'll be even worse next year, uh, but hey. Maybe it'll be okay. Uh, So happy to have you all here. I'll talk about my birthday and some other things in a moment. But first, I want to tell you who our guest is this week is Amanda Williamson. She is the program director at the Transcendence Treatment Center. That's an outpatient addiction treatment center for substance use disorder. It is located at 3900 Leeds Avenue in North Charleston. We'll give you all the rest of the information uh, about that program. It's also in the show notes. Uh, really important discussion uh, about folks dealing with these diseases, the substance use disorders, and um, not just them, but also their family and friends, because these are diseases that affect everyone. So a lot of important information, um, and I, I think it's a really good listen. So be sure to you know check that out here at the end of the episode. Uh, but first, we're going to dive in. Like I said, some stuff going on in my life. Had my birthday last Friday. Um uh, you know, relatively low key. I did do one thing. I went out to theater 99 to catch an improv show with one of my friends. It was during Charleston comedy, uh, festival. And it was, uh, the reason I went was because Amber Nash, uh, from Archer, for those of you who watch that, she plays Pam Poovey. Uh, she was there, um, to do an improv with her husband. They both are out of Atlanta, uh, a place called dad's garage, which is, you know, like Atlanta's version of theater 99. Um, and, uh, yeah, they were performing and it was a lot of fun. The folks from theater 99 were there as well. And, uh, of course, really, really funny. Great to see, uh, Amber in person, um, performing, you know, you know, something that she is known for her improv skills. And it was good. It was, a, it was a nice fun night, nice low key thing. We didn't really do too, too much else. And, uh, yeah, it was good, you know, just keeping it quiet. Uh, but the rest of the weekend, I, I still had some fun. Went to the uh, Captain's Comic Expo, uh, Ca- Captain's uh, Comics in West Ashley. Uh, they put this on every year. They do an amazing job. Their stores in West Ashley, but the expo is in Mount Pleasant at the uh, Omar Shrine uh, facility just by Patriots Point. Uh, it was really cool. I've been there a couple times before, but not in a couple years. Uh, you know, they have comic books, which, uh, you know, I started to get into a little bit after all these Marvel movies, which I love, but I I read them all on my phone through an app when I do read them. So I was more there for like kind of just seeing the people in their costumes, which is always fun. Seeing all the kids getting excited about all the stuff that was there. Um, I collect these dumb little Funko pop figurines you may have seen. So I wanted to see if there was some there. So, you know, just walked around, checked out all the booths, uh, walked away with some fun little uh, toys for myself. And uh, on Sunday, I went back with a friend uh, who was excited to hear about some of the stuff that was there. So um, I actually went on back to back days being the nerd that I am. Um, and it was fun. It was just a nice birthday weekend thing to do. Um, it always sen- tends to fall around my birthday, which is fun. So I can always justify why I'm buying way too many toys for myself. Um, cause Hey, it's my birthday. What the hell? Uh, so that was good. Um, also I did try, uh, old Lee's finally, which my producer, Lindsay Collins of LMC sound system has a podcast F and B radio. And she, uh, highly recommended this place. And I've heard a couple other people say how good it is. It's a Chinese restaurant and uh, they do deliver uh, a lot of places. So I actually had them deliver and uh, yeah, it was fantastic. You know, I only was able to try a couple things. Um, I went with like Kung Pao chicken and then they have this like uh, chicken cheese. I forget the official name of it, but basically it's just chicken with cheese in the middle, melted cheese and, you know, like uh, almost deep fried, like there's breading around it. And, you know, that seems very American to me. <laughs> um, but, you know, so of course it was enjoyable and the Kung Pao chicken was awesome. But I hear everything there is fantastic. So I can't wait to try some more. Um, so, yeah, certainly recommend that based on my one experience. Um, also, uh, Charleston Wine and Food Festival, as we're recording this, is officially underway. Uh, I went to opening night, which was fun. It was in the cistern yard. Perfect weather for it. Um, nice to have some space and be outdoors under the uh, oak trees and everything. The Spanish moss hanging down. So pretty. Um, and Charleston's top restaurants are there. Opening night every year is similar to Culinary Village where, you know, you go in there and all the, um, you know, restaurants have their own little table. They have little samples of whatever dish they decide to provide. And, of course, so many delicious uh, treats were there. And it was just so much fun um, to 
you know, see a lot of people I, I haven't seen in a couple of years. You know, there's people that I know who work for, you know, PR companies or restaurants or, you know, whatever it may be, other bloggers and uh, Instagram uh, personalities that, you know, we just haven't had events over the last couple of years. So it was nice. I got to see a lot of people um, as well as meet some new folks, which is always uh, fun at these events, you know, putting faces to the uh, emails that I get about uh, businesses and things. So overall, a good time. Um, I've got a full weekend of several other events, uh, but this podcast we're obviously recording before that. By the time you hear this, hopefully I have survived Wine and Food Week and I haven't been, you know, put in a wheelbarrow and brought to the hospital because I ate way too much food. Um, you know, we'll we'll keep you posted on that. So that's what's going on here in Holy City Centerland. So now we'll move to some of the top topics from this last week. Uh, last week, we uh, touched on the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine, which is obviously ongoing um, and is just a horrible situation for those folks. Uh, President uh, Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine has become something of a uh, folk hero because he is staying there and with the troops and uh, like really he's in there. He's not hiding. Um, he provides updates and he's kind of, yeah, like I said, he's kind of become a folk hero in the United States. And, you know, there's a lot of sad stories, of course, uh, that have come out of this whole thing. But uh, one, I wanted to say it's been nice seeing folks in Charleston kind of rally behind and show their support, uh, especially Euro Foods, uh, a restaurant here in Charleston. They've had some gatherings and they've also uh, are collecting supplies. And I'm sure they will still be doing that. Uh, when you hear this, check them out on Instagram. They have slides of all the different stuff that they are collecting for um, people who are in the Ukraine. Um, so it's been great seeing that City Hall had the Ukraine flag put up. They also lit up City Hall in blue and yellow, the flag's color. So it's been nice to seeing that support, even if, you know, it's it's not directly doing anything as far as like the flag and the lights. But uh, it's a nice, um, nice sentiment by the city for sure. Um, but, you know, in that same vein, I want to talk about two stories that, you know, have uh, I just thought were really unique and cool, um, you know, as it relates to the situation. All right. So the uh, first story, and I want to reiterate, these are just things that jumped out at me. They're obviously not the most important thing that's going on there. Um, some of them uh, involve some levity. Um, some have both levity and also uh, tragic endings. But uh, these are just stories that jumped out at me, and that's why I'm sharing them. So uh, the first one uh, involves uh, an island known as Snake Island, which is located in the Black Sea. Uh, audio had emerged of Ukrainians defending that island after receiving a warning from Russian forces before the attack. I, it just, just shows you the resolve um, of the folks in the Ukraine. Um, so the a Russian warship or warships were approaching, but one sent out a transmission um, that said, quote, I am a Russian warship. I suggest you lay down your arms and surrender to avoid bloodshed and unnecessary victims or you will be bombed, end quote. Uh, a male Ukrainian soldier is then heard saying, quote, so that's that's it, dot, dot, dot. Should I tell them to fuck themselves, <laughs> end quote? Is, this is the Ukrainian soldier talking to, uh, you know, someone else that's not on the island. A female Ukrainian soldier responds, well, just in case. And so that male soldier then responds to the Russian warship, quote, warship, go fuck yourself, end quote. So I, unfortunately, uh, it didn't go um, their way. Uh, Russia ended up... Uh, taking over that island, basically, and, and the soldiers from the Ukraine died. But just showing that bravery and just obstinance in the face of, you know, what they might have known was could go very, very wrong for them. And I just, you know, I just thought that was an interesting story and just shows like, again, just the bravery and like, hey, look, this is our country. You shouldn't be here. And we're not just going to lay down our weapons. Um, I, I thought that was a good story. Again, I wish it turned out differently, but just love them standing up. Uh, the second one is similar. Thankfully, um, from all reports, the woman I'm about to talk about is okay. Um, but this story has to do with the sunflower, which is the uh, Ukraine's national flower. It's becoming a gold, excuse me. It's becoming a global symbol of solidarity. Um, and the reason for that is in a video that recently went viral, uh, an elderly Ukrainian woman was heard yelling at armed Russian soldiers that were on Ukrainian soil. They had showed up in her neighborhood she did not care. She went right up to them, was you know cursing at them, saying they shouldn't be here. And the soldier um, 
you know, thankfully didn't escalate and kept telling her like, you know, we're, this conversation is going, not going anywhere. Please just step back. Um, and she was unharmed, thankfully. But in, in part of her cursing and, and scolding them, um, she said something along the lines of take, she literally had sunflower seeds in her pocket and she dropped them at their feet and said, take these seeds. So sunflowers grow here when you die. Uh, that according to a BBC News report. But again, that video ended up going viral. You can see it for yourself out there. Uh, obviously, um, you have it, it, these are based on the captions. Um, I don't speak any uh, other language other than English. So I'm trusting the news sources on this one. But again, just this old woman that this could have gone bad. It's it's a war. You just never know what could happen. Those soldiers could have harmed her or, or you know, taken her into custody who knows but she was like look you're in my neighborhood and you shouldn't be here and then just that kind of like withering like just guaranteeing in her mind that look you don't belong here and you're gonna die but at least you know when you die sunflower seeds will grow here or sunflowers will grow from these seeds and again i just thought that was just like a brave and just a badass woman um i, I really enjoyed that story and because of that, yeah, the sunflowers kind of become like a way to show solidarity. Uh, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden ha had a sunflower on her mask that she wore during the State of the Union. Uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand uh, from New York uh, did something similar with a sunflower. So, um, again, just showing that solidarity with folks has also been encouraging as well. From the global level, we'll come back down to the state level uh, with our next story. This is from an Associated Press article on February 26th. Um, and as an update, uh, we've talked about the gerrymandered um, congressional districts that were drawn, were approved by both the South Carolina Senate and House, and uh, governor signed. Um, a group on behalf of the NAACP has been suing over this. Uh, well, unfortunately, according to this article, the uh, 2022 elections will likely use those maps. Um, so these possible federal trials over whether South Carolina's new election districts discriminate against black folders has been delayed for several months, making it likely these new maps will be used for U S house and state house elections in 2022. So wanted to provide that update. Very disappointing that when there's an active trial, um, they're still going to use these, uh, districts that could in the end be determined to be gerrymandered and they'll have to change them. So I don't know what that would mean, uh, I guess they would just let the election results stand because technically uh, they were legal at the time, but just really disappointing that there isn't like a, if there's a trial that they don't revert back to the old original lines or have some kind of compromise. So unfortunately, because these trials could take a while, these gerrymandered, um, in, you know, that's my opinion, not technically official in any official capacity. We have to wait for these federal trials to, to determine if they are gerrymandered or not, but they will be in place um, for these midterm elections. Uh, next one is a news story. Uh, it was posted in the Post and Courier, February 22nd. Um, there's, a, there's a couple levels to this. First, the story itself. Um, the Citadel said that a now former cadet who posted a racist Snapchat story several months ago that contained a racial slur is no longer with the school. Uh, the former cadet posted a selfie in front of a group of people who were hanging up a portrait of the college's first two black cadets. Uh, those cadets, by the way, their names are Charles Foster and Joseph Shine. Uh, those cadets were honored with that portrait being hung in the Great Hall of the Citadel's Daniel Library back in November. And, and by the way, yes, this happened in November, but the school uh, wasn't aware of the Snapchat until recently. That's why it's in the news now here in February. Um, in that Snapchat post, a former cadet mocked the college for hanging up a painting of two black men who he called the N-word in his Snapchat. Uh, the Citadel said in an emailed statement February 22nd that its leadership only recently was made aware of the social media post, which I just said. They called it vile, um, and then they mentioned that the cadet is no longer with the school, which is the right move. Uh, the college said uh, in their response, quote, there is no excuse for this violation of human decency and dignity. Racism in any form is not tolerated at, the, at this college where the core values of honor, duty, and respect will be upheld, end quote. Um, so a couple things. One, Citadel, right thing. Absolutely. This person does not deserve to be at their school. Um, and as many know, the Citadel has a very not great history um, with racism and racial uh, issues. Uh, so glad to see here in 2022, they did the right thing being on the right side of this. Uh, but the other side of this story is uh, the Post and Courier 
Uh, their headline was Citadel Cadet who posted racially offensive Snapchat story no longer at school. And they use that same phrasing, that racially offensive in the lead to the story. Um, I was confused. I, you know, I didn't know the story. I saw that. I was like, okay, racially offensive. I wonder what this is about. And then after reading it, I'm like, this is racist. It's not, yes, technically it's racially offensive, but just call it what it is. It's racist. This person made a racist comment. It was a racist Snapchat story. There, there's, I don't know why we're like almost downplaying it a little. Like, well, it was racially offensive. We don't want to call it racist. I mean, the Citadel called it racist. So even if the newspaper was like, you know, because I know uh, in addition to all these racism um, stories and claims over the last few years, um, you know, when the Black Lives Matter um, movement really picked up after the murder of George Floyd, uh, we saw newspapers and media outlets struggling with what to call certain incidents because, like, our, you know, we're the news. We're supposed to provide both sides of the story or be as unbiased as we can. Should we not be, you know, they struggled with calling things racist or not, just like they struggled with Donald Trump and the presidency. They struggled with, do we call this statement false? Do we call him a liar? This is, you know, they were struggling with that. So I get it. But at the same time, if it's clearly a lie or clearly racist, why are we, why are we sugarcoating it? Just, it, it was racist. End of story. I, I don't know why I, I tweeted that um, to them. No surprise. I didn't respond to it. And the headline as of today is still the same. Um, yeah, I don't know why they chose that. Again, technically it is correct, but I don't know why we're almost downplaying it by using that kind of language. Just, you know, call a thing what it is. Um, it was racist. End of story. All right. Some better news, some happy news, um, which in a way will tie into my guest. Um, I, I'm sure you all are familiar, even if you don't know the name, uh, the Riviera, the theater on uh, at 225 King Street. Uh, you may have seen it. It's got the old school uh, board out front. Um, it looks like it has some lights and it could be really, really pretty when it's lit up. Um, it's uh, a 1930s art deco theater. Uh, it's, you know, it has events here and there, but they're very few and far between. Uh, but they did announce that they're going to hold it, their inaugural concert with Grammy nominated artist Jewel. Uh, it'll be on Friday, February 18th. Um, this is ahead of her upcoming album release. Uh, her next album is going to be called free will free wheeling woman. That is tough to say. Uh, doors will open at 7 PM and the official title of the event is called never broken an evening with Jewel at the Riv. Um, and so why does this tie into our guest today? They are, uh, Partnering, the venue is partnering with Jewel and some local organizations, and they hope to aim. Uh, their aim is to raise awareness around the mental health needs in our communities and shining a light on the resources that are available to people of all ages. Um, in addition to her solo acoustic performance, Jewel is going to be sharing stories about the pivotal role mental health awareness has played in her own life. Uh, she will also discuss the personal practices she's adopted to help improve her mental health and strengthen her resilience over the years. So, yeah, I think this is pretty cool. Not only is the theater going to have some life, going to have an event. Um, they also announced, by the way, that they are planning more concerts that will be announced later. So it looks like we're getting another concert venue, which is really great. And it's it seems like from the outside, I haven't been inside. It's a really cool um, venue. It's 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 historical. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what it looks like on the inside and, and the types of artists they bring, because Jewel is a pretty big name. So, um, you know, obviously her biggest hits were what in the 90s, but you know, still a very big name and it's cool that they are uh, tying this into mental health and partnering with these organizations who will be on site uh, as well. Uh, tickets are on sale now. You can find them through Ticketmaster. But yeah, I'm excited to see what other concerts come and, and end up at that venue and we'll certainly keep you posted. So that's it for headlines and topics this week. Um, as mentioned, that last story about mental health will certainly tie into my guest this week, Amanda Williamson. She is the program director at the Transcendence Treatment Center, which is an outpatient addiction treatment center for substance use disorder. It is located on Leeds Avenue in North Charleston. Uh, we'll tell you where you can get more information. It's also in the show notes. But this is a topic, mental health and addiction, that's important to me. And um, there's a lot of stigma out there with both. And, uh, you know, we talk about that as well as what that facility does. And I think there's a lot of really important information in here. So uh, be sure to listen. A lot of us are touched by uh, you know, mental health issues in general, but specifically addiction and just about every family. Um, so I, I think this is a really important topic. And you know, thanks so much for listening all the way through. And I'll see you after this interview with Amanda Williamson. 
Joining me now is Amanda Williamson, the program director at the Transcendence Treatment Center, an outpatient addiction treatment center for substance use disorder. It is located at 3900 Leeds Avenue in North Charleston. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you for having me. We appreciate it. Of course. So uh, I guess let's just start talking about you so people can know a little bit about yourself. You know, just a quick bio so listeners get a better understanding of who you are and, and how you got involved with the center and, and these types of treatments. Sure. Um, I actually started my career in addictions as a residential assistant uh, in a group home for adolescents who are struggling with addictions and mental health issues. Uh, within about two years in that position, I ended up being the counselor uh, with a bachelor's degree, and I have been in the field ever since. <laughs> nice. I have uh, I have um, been in pretty much every level of care associated with ad- addiction treatment, uh, from detox to residential to outpatient. Um, let's see. Uh, I am a licensed professional counselor, which means I can do both mental health and substance abuse counseling services. And I became the director for Transcendence in September of 2020, and we officially opened our doors in May of 2021. Nice. What uh, what drew you to the mental health field and, and specifically addiction treatment? Um, I, as far as the mental health field goes, it's actually kind of funny. I was a, a peer a student mediator in high school, so that's where it started. Hmm. Um, I, I initially wanted to become a uh, guidance counselor, and um, this actually just kind of fell into my lap when I uh, got the position as a residential assistant. Okay. Now, now that we understand a little bit about you, uh, let, tell us a little bit about the uh, Transcendence Treatment Center. What is it, and what sort of services do you provide? Sure. Um, now, as you mentioned, we are an outpatient uh, service provider. Uh, we have several different levels of treatment that we can provide. Uh, one was partial hospitalization. Uh, this is would be six hours a day, five days a week. This is where the individual goes home at the end of the day or goes to work and takes care of family, whatever else they need to do. Uh, the next would be intensive outpatient services, and that is three hours a day, three days a week. And then after that would be general outpatient services, which can be anywhere from one to four individual therapy sessions depending on what the client needs. We also uh, provide evaluation and medication monitoring for Suboxone, and we have a free family and friends support group that we provide through Zoom. And then the last thing that we like to do for the community is we are a community distribution center for Narcan. Okay, got you. That's yeah, that's good to know too. Because we'll get into that. You know, the uptick we've seen in in you know this field. But I also uh, I didn't realize some of the stuff I saw when I was looking at your website. I'm glad that the listeners are hearing it too. I, I didn't realize there's also family support provided, which is great because mental health and specifically addiction treatments affect everyone, um, not just the person Absolutely. who's suffering from it. So it's good that there's family support out there as well. Um, yep. Now. There are other uh, facilities and, and treatment options that are out there. How does uh, your business differ from other treatment options, or what sets you apart? Well, Transcendence Treatment Center takes a holistic approach to treatment and recovery. It's not enough just to learn how to manage the symptoms of addiction. The individual really has to kind of dig deeper into the whys of the addiction and the hows of living a happy and fulfilling life. Um, this includes uh, being in touch with one's self, you know, with the physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the person. So we encourage our clients to explore alternative forms of care, such as yoga, meditation, mindfulness, and spirituality, just to name a few. Oh, good. So, yeah, it's not just what, you know, people think about when it comes to 12-step step programs. It's uh, treating uh, beyond that, which um, I think is, is is certainly good. You know, one option is better than none, but it, it is. I like that you guys have that kind of full scope um, to to really treat folks who are who are suffering. Um, you know, getting into that now that we we know you know what your facility provides and the sort of help. Sort of touching on what I mentioned before, what are some of the common misconceptions that we're still running into in this day and age about addiction and recovery? Um, individuals struggling with addiction have been stigmatized and marginalized for as long as drugs and alcohol have been around. One of the biggest misconceptions is that individuals 
should be able to just stop using and mm. that the continued use is a matter of choice. And this is far from the truth. Addiction is really a complicated disease of the brain in which the ability to make sound decisions and to learn from mistakes is greatly hindered. Uh, the chemicals of addiction work on that part of the brain that's uh, responsible for our survival. Um, and these chemicals produce so much dopamine that it causes the brain to put that, that use of the substance of the alcohol above everything else. So, you know, and, you know food, water, shelter, all that kind of goes out the window. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a horrible disease. And, you know, I like when you said that, you know, some people still think it's a matter of choice, you know, just because they can stop drinking at a certain point or, or stop using whatever their drug of choice may be, you know, and, you know, I'm good, I'll stop right there. It doesn't mean everybody else can. It's a disease, they can't help it. And that relates to mental health issues as well, unrelated to addictions, of course, whether it's anxiety, depression, you know, where people are like, oh, just have a better attitude, you know, just smile more, you know, it just doesn't work right. that way. <laughs> um, and, Absolutely. You know, unfortunately these are things that i think and, and you being the expert can let me know if this is true it, it seems we get better every year in some capacity with understanding these diseases and uh you know kind of eroding uh these misconceptions that people have and stigmas but you know there's still work to be done absolutely and and i think part of that is you know the language we use to refer to an individual who has an addiction um, you know, we, we've gone from calling people alcoholics and druggies and, and uh, tweakers or whatever, uh, when really we should, it's, it's a disease. We wouldn't call somebody cancer, you know. We right, would, good we point. We say somebody, a person with cancer. So how we speak about an individual who's struggling with, with addiction has a lot to do with that uh, stigmatizing. What sort of, what, what would you say instead of someone, you know, says, like, oh, they're an alcoholic or, you know, they're addicted to drugs. What, what is a more preferred um, term that you use or terms? I, I would say that I have an alcohol addiction. Mm. I wouldn't call myself an alcoholic or that individual is struggling with addiction rather than saying, you know, they're a druggie. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, yeah. You yeah. don't even think about that. It's just so commonplace, you know, and mm -hmm. even the 12 step program, you know, like Alcoholics Anonymous, like has it in the title, obviously, you know, but uh, that's interesting. Right. You know, words have meaning. We've, I've talked about that in this podcast about all manner of topics. So uh, I appreciate that as well. Um, you know, you having said that. Um, in addition to, you know, misconceptions and stigma and things like that, um, it seems that the issues of uh, addiction uh, are getting worse. Um, what, if any, trends have you noticed in patients, especially since the pandemic began? I, I'm sure you saw uh, DHEC here in South Carolina put out a report saying overdose deaths have increased more than 50% during the first year of the pandemic. Um, and it's also mm -hmm. up nationally as well. So have you noticed that trend in your work as well? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest parts of the recovery process is an individual support system. Um, you know, with this pandemic, that has greatly limited the face-to-face -face interactions that people have been able to have. Take uh, the 12-step supports like AA and NA. A lot of those were forced to go to virtual formats for a long period of time and are just now opening back up to in-person meetings. Um, this put a lot of folks in, the, in a kind of bad spot. I've had many people tell me they would not attend the, the Zoom support meetings because they just didn't feel like they were connecting, mm. um, you know, to the supports that were there. Um, had other people tell me that they would attend the meetings online, but they would turn their camera off and they would be drinking or using while they're oh, listening to the people talk, you know. So, um, you know, <laughs> There was much less engagement during the pandemic uh, with out other outside activities, too, you know, going out to coffee with friends, going mm -hmm. out to dinner, movies, whatever. All those things that, you know, we take for granted, those of us who are, who are not struggling with addiction, those are the things that keeps them focused on, you know, being involved in life and finding enjoyment. You know, it's, it's that isolation that, that really kind of set it all off for a lot of folks mm. and even those who didn't have addiction issues are now popping up with issues because they too are isolated so the social drinker who you know would drink with friends every now and then sitting at home bored 
and is developing an addiction because, you know, they spend some time drinking. So, yeah, I, I, it had to be so tough. And I know it was for people I know, you know, who, who struggle with addictions. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you mentioned isolation was part of it. Uh, I'm sure, you know, people maybe have lost their jobs or, you know, uh, weren't really working and things like that. Is that in talking to patients that you've dealt with, is that kind of what they said if they had a harder time during the pandemic or, or uh, it crept up during the pandemic, they didn't know they had an issue before. Is that kind of what they're saying was just the isolation? Was it boredom? Like what, what sort of things were they saying, you know, had kind of led them down a path they wouldn't have if the world was back to, you know, quote unquote normal. I, I think it's been a combination of those things. Um, for some, it was just the isolation. For others, it was a combination of being bored and isolated, um, losing their job, the financial stressors that went along with that as well. You know, so for those who didn't have really good coping skills to begin with, just the simple fact that they're isolated from others was enough. You know, and then for for others, it was just a compilation of built up stressors. Yeah, I mean, it certainly makes sense. Everybody struggled, let alone anyone who has any kind mm-hmm. of substance use disorder. Um, it, it, it's a tough time for everybody, but it makes sense. Unfortunately, that we've seen that kind of uptick um, over you know during this last couple of years. Um, it, uh, you know, it seems uh, you mentioned in that last comment about um, people not having, you know, the best coping skills, you know, folks who have these types of diseases and which also reinforces where like a 12 step program might not be enough, although it does talk about, you know, coping mechanisms and, and, and kind of rewiring your brain and things um, about the way you think about things. But uh, I think that's what's important about your facility and any others that offer in addition to, you know, whether it's therapy and things like that, as you mentioned, there's some other things they can do to treat the whole person because it's not just the, you know, the brain, you know, as far as like, Oh, I want this, you know, alcohol or I want these drugs or whatever it may be. A lot of it has to do with patterns of behavior and putting yourself in dangerous situations and and things like that, you know, trying to get to the bottom of, you know, in a, although they can't control the disease, you know, they can make steps to get themselves out of these uh, situations that can be triggering for them. Absolutely. That's one of the first things I do when I work with a client is um, help them to identify what we call positive intents for substance use. Nobody is going to use a drug or use alcohol unless they get something positive out of it in the beginning. Right. So if I can help them to identify what those things are, and help them to figure out a way to get those needs met without the use of alcohol or drugs, they're going to be more successful in the recovery than if they had not. What have you seen, you know, we talk about uh, in the news, it's always, you know, talking about opiates and and fentanyl and and how that has kind of shown up over however many years it's been and is leading to so many deaths. Are you seeing those trends as well, like the upticks in addiction to those substances? Surprisingly, since we've been open, the majority of the folks who are coming in and seeking treatment have been for alcohol for Hmm. our facility. Right. Um, And like I said, we are just newly open, and um, we may not be seeing the full the full effect of you know the opiate addiction on our side just yet. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I was gonna say I have seen it in other facilities where I've worked, you know, over the past year or two. where there has been an increasing number of people with opiate addiction, for mm. sure. With fentanyl, it seems it, there are some people, of course, who use it recreationally and want to, but it also seems like it's being added, whether it's cutting drugs or whatever, with it, and people are unaware of it, which just adds another level of danger um, to people who are using those types of drugs. Um, you know, they might not necessarily be seeking it out, but just another danger for anyone, you know, who's addicted, um, is having, you know, whatever their choice of, um, substances being cut with that. Yes, absolutely. Like I said, if you're buying stuff off the streets, you certainly don't know where it's coming from or what's in it. Mm. So that is a huge risk that they take every time that they go out and purchase you know, their substance of dependence. For people listening now who either for themselves, because um, I think there's two two very different um, 
paths to take here, but people for themselves are like, you know what, I, I do need help. Um, how can they uh, contact your facility or what's the best, met- met- best methods for them? Um, but also on the opposite side, if there's people listening and they have a friend or a family member who they think needs help, um, I know these are two separate questions, so take your time, but uh, what's the best way for them to, to seek out the appropriate treatment uh, for that family member or friend, um, you know, and how can they get more information? Sure. Um, they can reach out to any of their local substance use treatment providers and ask questions about where to start. Most of the treatment programs will complete a pre-screening process with the, the addicted individual just to make sure that they don't need something like medical detox mm. and to make sure that they will meet their level of care. Um, they can also seek out the, the 12-step supports in the area. As I'd mentioned earlier, having that positive support system is crucial to recovery. As for uh, here, transcendence, um, we don't we, we people don't need to be referred to our program. They can just give us a call, uh, and we'll answer whatever questions that they have to the best of our ability. We'll complete a pre screening over the phone, do the verification of benefits uh, for their insurance if they have that. We usually get that back in a very short amount of time. And if we're unable to serve the individual because they need a higher level of care for whatever reason, we will assist them with finding possible uh, treatment programs for them. And then we'll follow up to make sure that they got into some place that was suitable for them. That's good. And and for based on your experience or, you know, uh, your expertise in this, this field, the opposite side of the family or friends, you know, is it, should they be seeking out this information, you know, first, or what's the best way to approach someone they think may need help? Uh, I think education, getting some education themselves first on what's available as far as treatment and what's out there. Um, and then they really need to get their loved ones buy in, yeah. um, sitting down and talking to the individual, uh, about, you know, uh, getting some help and what services are available um, and then getting them because cause they're going to have to be the ones that call into the treatment program uh, to get the, to get it started. You know, you, you have to get their buy-in to, to kind of call in and, and get that pre-screening done and figure out what level of care they need to be in. Yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of important information and points you've made, but I think that's that's one where every person and every situation is different, you know, uh, just like any other disease. It, it attacks people mm-hmm. differently. People are at different levels in the, you know, however long they've had it. Um, you know, so it's important to keep that in mind that there's not a one-stop shop or solution for everybody. Um, I think that's important. I think what you mentioned about 12-step programs and and groups like that um, are great. They're super welcoming. They're there to help. Um, And one of the tenets of those programs tends to be that you have to give back what you were given so freely. Um, So Mm -hmm. they are, people are willing to help and they want to help. Um, So I think that's important as well. And, And for family and friends listening, like you said, education, super important to understand what what words or phrasing or the way you come at someone, um, when you're trying to express that you want to help them, you know, could set that person off, you know, so there's a lot of right. education is always key in these situations for mm-hmm. sure. And, and if the, if the family member has someone who's addicted to opiates, I highly recommend that they come in, take a brief five minute training and, and get some Narcan in their possession. Um, that could save their loved one's life in the event of an accidental overdose. Uh, Even if it's, if you have an elderly family member who takes pain medication, it is not a bad idea to have Narcan on hand because we know that, you know, um, elderly folks can sometimes forget what meds Mm -hmm. they've taken and what ones they haven't. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that would be a, a, a good thing to have on hand just, you know, just in case. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. And then you said that your facility has Narcan and, and people are able to pick it up. Is it free? Is there a cost for it? Uh, it is free. All they got to do is stop in and let us know that they, um, you know, they would like to get trained and, and have some Narcan on hand to make sure that their family members safe. 
good, good. We're happy to do that for them. And uh, uh, there also are groups out there for families, too. I forgot to mention, you know, for those who, who have family members or friends dealing with um, any of these diseases, there are support groups for that as well that may be beneficial to figure out not just best practices for how to, to – you know, interact with that person, but also for themselves, how they're, how they deal with those types of things. So there's, you know, those options out there for people as well. And I'm sure they can call your facility and and ask questions and, and, you know, see what, Mm -hmm. what um, resources are available to folks. If you don't necessarily provide them, you can direct them to the appropriate place. We certainly can. Um, And we do have a family and friends support group every Tuesday at 11 it is uh, virtual at this point, so it's over Zoom. And if anybody's interested, they can check out our Facebook page and get the link to that as well. Great. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely give you a chance here at the end to, uh, you know, shout out where people can get more information. But before we do that, um, number one, thank you so much for the work you do in this field. Uh, it's important to me and so many others and for taking the time to chat with me. Is there anything I didn't talk about um, that you think is important or you think people should know um, that's related to everything we've been discussing? Um. I think the the biggest thing is for people to you know to educate themselves about a, what what addiction is, um, so that we can kind of get over the stigma that people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol are bad people. Mm-hmm. They're not bad people. It can happen to anybody. Um, addiction doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care how old you are, how young you are, how much money you make. None of that matters uh, when it comes to addiction. Um, so, yeah, uh, education is key to kind of um, bringing this stigma uh, to an end and helping as many people as possible get treatment. Well said. I think that's a great sentiment and a great spot to stop. Um, what? Uh, where can people uh, go to get more information? Um, any any platform is good to mention so whatever whatever you all have sure we have um, we have our uh, page on facebook it's a transcendence treatment center we also have our um, website which is t the letter t treatment.org um, anybody can email us at any time at info at t treatment.org if they have questions or just give us a call and uh, i'll be sure to put some of those links or if not all of them into the uh, show notes so for those listening if you didn't have a chance to write it down you don't need to rewind we'll have them in the show notes so you you can click over and, and check out what's available and um you know get, find any information and help you may need so uh, amanda williamson thank you so much for joining me um i think this is really important information and and hopefully this will um provide some education or, or some much needed help for some folks so so thank you so much for taking the time today And thank you for having us, Christian. We really appreciate it. And that is it. Thank you so much to Amanda Williamson for joining us again. Check the show notes for all that information. If you're looking for um, help or or just some more details, um, I I can't thank her enough for coming on. Such an important topic. And especially, as we mentioned, uh, over these last few years, as there's been an uptick in, um, you know, deaths related to overdoses and things of that nature. So thank you to her for uh, coming on the program today. Thank you to you guys for listening. I I greatly appreciate uh, you stopping by for another week. Please rate and review. If you're on Apple, subscribe and all that good stuff. Spread the word. Share this podcast with people who you think may enjoy it. Uh, Anytime you folks do that, it helps out for sure. Uh, You can also support Holy City Center in this podcast by sharing um, any stories that I ever post, um, letting friends know, family know what, what we're doing here. Um, you can also go to patreon.com slash Holy City Center. Uh, you pay just a little bit here and there, uh, you know, every month, a couple bucks, and you can get some behind the scenes information. And depending on what level you're on, sometimes I send you some merch. You don't want to do that. That's okay. We sell that merch anyway. Go to holycitycenter.com slash store. We've got mass uh, hats, cups, all sorts of fun stuff, koozies, you name it. Uh, also want to say thank you to Tyler Boone for providing all the music in each of these episodes and Lindsay Marie Collins for producing. Check her out at LMC Sound System and f and Radio. I hope you all have a great week. Hopefully I did survive Charleston Wine and Food Festival. 
um, probably heavier, uh, but you know, no worse for the wear. And I'll see you all soon. Good night and good luck. <laughs> <laughs>